I'd like to make two quick announcements, please. Two quick announcements. The first one is that the one book, the one book that was not in before, To Become a Sage by Michael Carlton, is now in at The Coop. Okay, and that's a book that we'll be reading over a two week period. So you really should go ahead and pick it up, okay? Michael Carlton's book, To Become a Sage, is available at The Coop now. The second announcement is that the folks of Payne Hall have asked me to please announce that you should not eat or drink in this hall, okay? Please, <laughs> please don't bring any drinks or food into this hall. Thanks. Someone uh, requested to make an announcement beginning last week. I would also like to uh, make one, one announcement. Uh, we are organizing a small discussion session conducted in Mandarin, which is uh, additional and optional. We'll meet, the first meeting will be next Wednesday from 2 to 3 in room 203, Vanser. If we have two people showed up, we'll have that section. All right. If there's one, okay, we can have a dialogue. Uh, the topic today is self in transformation. A central concern of mine is how is it possible to develop an idea of personhood or selfhood which is not abstract, which is based upon concrete human experience, and yet it is neither subjectivistic nor simply particularistic. In a sense, this idea of the person in the concrete can also be objectively valid and uh, universally, uh, and can also appeal to an universal idea. How can we have something which is very concrete, particular, not abstract, and yet, it is not just subjective, it can be objective, not just uh, confined to a particular time and space, but it can be generalized. That's the central concern. The Confucian idea of Junzi, which is often rendered as gentleman, but the emphasis is on gentle, or nobleman, emphasis on nobility, or superior person, emphasis on superiority. But my preference is to simply render it as a profound person, the emphasis on profoundness or profundity. This idea of a person who's noble, gentle, superior, superior of course in the sense of the power of self-transcendence, not superior to others, not the Nietzschean idea of the overman or the superior man. This idea often is considered as idea of social status, someone who has special social status or even political power, not just a scholar, but also an official or bureaucrat or politician. But I think it's important to remember that in the classical Confucian formulation of this idea, the Junzi is basically an ethical religious concept, a moral idea. It is neither sociological nor political in that sense. Fingeret has really challenged us because he argues that you don't have to imagine the idea of an inner person, of an inner life to understand the Confucian style of moral reasoning. So the question for us is whether a person of that nature has the capacity of generating internally resources for self-development. Can the person generate moral and spiritual resources for self-transformation? Or the person will have to rely upon 
external conditions for trying to develop the idea of nobility, superiority, or profundity. One common human condition that is fully recognized by the Confucians is that each one of us is structurally limited. Structurally limited in the sense there's so many things we cannot choose. We cannot choose our parents. We cannot choose the time and place of our birth. We cannot choose the early phases of our socialization. We cannot choose our linguistic universe. We cannot choose our environment in general. And yet, there is a faith that even though we are structurally limited, the process by which we become what we are indicates there is a procedural freedom. That process indicates there is a freedom of determining within that context numerous possibilities. There are infinite possibilities for self-actualization within the constraint. So despite limitness, each one of us has total freedom in trying to improve ourselves. At any moment, in any kind of situation. An extreme case, it's very useful for us to understand it in the Confucian tradition, is called the case of Helen Keller. She couldn't hear, she couldn't see, there's no way that she could utter a word. And yet, she managed not only to overcome all these structural limitations, she became even a writer, a very inspirational writer. We admire a Helen Keller not only for what she is in fact capable, she in fact capable of overcoming the structural limitation, which is beyond imagination for any of us. But also for the steadfastness of purpose, determination, patience, the commitment to practice on a daily, uh, daily process that makes her awe-inspiring performance possible in the first place. There was something irreducible in her being that is her determination to improve herself, to enhance her capacity for communication, for expression, and for even uh, aesthetic self-realization. So the worst possible case, a person who's not able, to, not able to see, not able to hear, not able to speak, and eventually was able to communicate in the most refined manner. And her ability to improve herself indicates no matter how structurally we're limited, the possibility of self-improvement is totally unlimited. There's freedom in that constraint of necessities. Of course, there are numerous cases where self-improvement improvement in the physical sense is an unsurmountable task. The greatest disciple of Confucius died young. So this person, he could not have experienced the state of human perfection at the age of 40, at the age of 50, at the age of 60, at the age of 70. He could not have imagined the possibility of realizing what Confucius finally realized, that is, what he ought to do turned out to be what he really wanted to do. The fusion of desires on the one hand and uh, moral perfection on the other, because he died young in his 30s. Some people died even younger. Now, these are limitations, to be sure. But I think the message in the Confucian tradition is that not just to transcend the structural limitations, but also to transform the structural limitations into instruments of self-realization. I become what I ought to be, not because I have abandoned many of the things, my ethnicity, my linguistic universe, my gender, my lack of intelligence, lack of sensitivity, and so forth. But because my ability to recognize who I am and capable of using the limited 
structural resources as instruments, as conditions for my self-realization. And this is the reason why the focus is not on political prominence, social influence, one become very wealthy that can use money to do all kinds of things, but on education, especially education for self-realization. Now, the classical formulation of the Confucian idea of education is self-improvement and public service. We try to educate ourselves so we can we become better persons. And since each person is always a center of relationships rather than an isolated individual, the person ought to be involved in public service. In the beginning, I can only help one person besides myself. There may be two or three, eventually maybe quite a few, provided I'm grounded in my own being and capable of realizing myself as a center of relationships. But education here is very broadly defined. It is not simply education for the acquisition of knowledge alone. This reminds me in the 60s, there was a major debate in the United States concerning the purpose of higher education. What is higher education for? Why should one go to college to be educated? One very powerful or even pervasive argument at the time is higher education is a service station for society. Society requires all these service stations, you know, like the gasoline stations. And that would be able to fuel the engine of society for further development. At the time, everybody was interested in modernization, development, so higher education is intended to provide the state of California, the state of Massachusetts, and so forth to become modernized. So nobody questioned the value of higher education as a service station for society. But quite a few scholars, especially those who are in the humanities and social sciences, begin to ask the question, if social service is narrowly defined, then a very important mission of the university is being totally relegated to the background. For example, the transmission of culture and the transmission of knowledge. Sometimes basic research in physics will have no social service or social function in the next five years or 10 years. But maybe in the 20 or 30 or 50 years, it will become very useful. The numerous cases of that nature, knowledge for its own sake, transmission of culture for its own sake. If we have a very narrow-minded, pragmatic idea of education, then I think uh, two-thirds of the departments in, in the arts and sciences uh, should be either marginalized or closed because their relationship what is the relationship between the study of Sanskrit literature to the economic development of Massachusetts? What is the relationship of studying classical Chinese philosophy to the well-being of uh, our social service in a specifically uh, defined manner? So the transmission of culture has to be a much broader vision. So service has to be understood in a much broader context. There are many scholars at the time also realized Higher education should provide conditions for self-realizations, different styles of self-realization of students. Some students may have special talents, special potentialities. They need to be nourished to be realized. And the university should be a place for the nourishment of individual talents. And finally, there's also the statement that universities should play the role of a feedback mechanism as a center for social, political, and cultural criticism. The university should not accept the rules of the game in the political arena, social, economic arena for granted. They should be able to raise challenging questions about the rationality, about the underlying reasons of these kind of ideas. If we do not have a critical center, we will not be able to do that. So these four functions then gradually recognize as all legitimate, important for higher education. Service station for society, transmission of culture or basic knowledge, environments for the realizations of different talents, and political, social, and cultural criticism. Now, the Confucian idea of a noble person, or a superior person, of a profound person, 
is someone who's linked to all these four important arenas of learning. The Confucian path then is a dynamic, holistic path. It's not a static path. It is not simply say learning is for the sake of the acquisition of knowledge alone. It is not a limited path, the cultivation of the mind at the expense of the body. It is a holistic process. As a holistic process, it envisions three integrated arenas in which one learns to be fully human. The aesthetic, the ethic, and the religious. In the modern academic context, these three arenas are clearly differentiated as different disciplines. In aesthetics, including music to be sure, the emphasis on human feeling, the sensuality of the body. Experience, aesthetic experience is critical. When you move into the area of ethics, your behavior is governed by rules and regulations, not just your outpouring of feelings and sensuality. When you move to the realm of religion, some of the ethical regulations become somewhat irrelevant. The most important aspect in the religious arena will be the question of faith. This is normally we take to be three very different arenas of human experience. But we have to change the rules of the game in order to understand the Confucian path as holistic process of self-realization. It is based upon basic human feelings. Sympathy, for example, empathy, these are basic human feelings. Except these feelings will have to be cultivated to be harmonized, to be transformed. So these feelings will be expressed in such a way that the feelings of others will not be heard. In fact, some kind of harmonization of many different kinds of feelings becomes the goal. Therefore, to be ethical is not to follow the rules of the game without reference to very powerful inner feelings. Ethics, in fact, is a way of how to express these feelings in harmonious, measured, regularized ways so other people will, will be able to express their feelings as well. So the sensuality of the body or the importance of feelings are not relegated to the background in the ethical realm. Ethics will be greatly impoverished if feelings are not honored as important constitutive part. If we only put rationality as the most important aspect of moral reasoning without taking into consideration of the basic feelings, often irrational, our ethical project would not be complete. So how to transform our feelings, very basic feelings, including feelings of sex and appetite, and of course commiseration and other kind of feelings, and gradually transform them so we become socially responsible person as in the ethical realm, would not be able to understand how the Confucian moral reasoning actually proceeds. Ethics is not complete. Ethics has to be extended to a realm that is beyond the human world here and now to allow ethics to be completed. So ethics has to be extended to the religious realm. As I noted last time, spirits and ghosts are important for us. Our ancestors, now biologically speaking, our ancestors, but intellectually speaking, our ancestors, those students who came here before, those teachers, those philosophers, uh, those people who inform us why the university is a great university, why the university has its own collective consciousness, which we cherish, which we try to develop, why we take part in a procession, in a process of learning, which is not just the people here. We are responsible not only for our actions here, but responsible for our intellectual forefathers, for those people who invested time and energy and their lives to make this an important institute for higher learning. So even the name itself is not devoid of substance. There's a tremendous substance in the name if we invested continuously to make it truly meaningful. 
So in this sense, the process of learning to be human as a holistic process will have to go through the aesthetic, the ethic, and religious, religious realms. They are interconnected. Try to see the connectedness of these realms rather than they are totally different. They're not different domains of human experience. They can be integrated into a process of learning. Now, one indication of this, of course, in the analyze, Confucius warned against three things, again, in a holistic way. When you're young, the vital energy is terrific. Beware of sex. When you are older, the energy is still there. Beware of aggressiveness. When your energy declines, when you, are, you already retire, beware of possessiveness. Now, this is to indicate the understanding, let's say, of the body is an energy field. The body is not simply bono structure, muscles, that's muscles and uh, uh, skeletons. The body is an energy field. And you have to use your energy wisely. The way to use energy wisely is through self-knowledge. The warning is to say you have to enhance your energy. When your energy is in excessive, uh, sufficient, even in excessive, in, in uh, excessive supply, be very careful not to be wasteful. When you have tremendous energy, you have tremendous creative power, try not to be aggressive. When the energy is declining, try not to be possessive. So you have to look at your life in the total spectrum from youth to middle age to old age to be able to anticipate, also to be able to reflect. The reason is there are two dimensions to the whole Confucian path that need to be integrated. The one is the dimension I call it identity, related to the idea of the meaning of life. The other one is adaptation, flexibility, how you will be able to live through a very complicated life be able to enhance your energy, to always be alert and able to use it wisely. Identity means an inner direction of what you want to become. But the inner direction ought not to be totally conditioned by narrowly defined professionalism. That's why the idea is that a true profound person is never a vessel, never simply a means to an end always an end in itself. As an end, we may assume many different social roles. We may want to become a lawyer, to become a doctor, to become a businessman, to become an engineer, or to become a researcher, to become a scholar. Any of these roles helps us to become what we ought to be if our goal is simply to become a prof professional. From the Confucian point of view, your vision is too narrow you become disappointed very soon. And you need to look at your self-development as a process of inner direction for the enhancement of the energy that you'll be able to have and to be able to adapt to new situations. Some people become so much obsessed with their inner direction. They cannot flexibly adapt themselves to the changing conditions. So the ability to adapt to changing conditions to to enhance one's inner direction becomes an art. This art is to negotiate one and many. There should always be some core values that we cherish. Never sacrifice those core values because you sacrifice those core values for expediency. You may sacrifice a great deal of your self-respect, of your self-direction. In the long run, it's too costly. But at the same time, you cannot be a narrow-minded fundamentalist in the sense that the values that I cherish must be the values that everybody else ought to cherish. If they don't, there must be something wrong with them. So you have to be open enough to be challenged in that process. 
how to negotiate the one and the many in terms of inner direction on the one hand and the flexibility in adapting to the changing environment on the other becomes a major challenge. Now the Confucian, the Confucian idea of uh, the noble person is often understood as a scholar. But this idea of the scholar is very different from either the Greek idea of the philosopher or the Judaic idea of the prophet. A scholar in this sense with a social responsibility as an important concern is not simply a philosopher because the philosopher with emphasis on the life of the mind, sometimes a, a typical philosopher is someone who is totally unmindful of his ordinary existence. Remember this Greek philosopher who always wanted to look above, so he fell, he fell into the well without knowing where he was walking. This, this total inattention to ordinary human existence is sometimes a hallmark of a true philosopher. But the Confucian idea of a junzi, of a scholar, is someone who is very thickly rooted in ordinary human activity. Often, he could turn out to be a bureaucrat, doing very mundane work on a daily basis. But the Confucian scholar is not simply a prophet, because there's no notion in the Confucian tradition of the voice of God being heard by the chosen who will be able to translate that particular voice to the multitude. But there is a kind of priestly function and even philosophical role in both the public image and self-definition of the Confucian scholar. So one way of looking at this particular person, this particular idea of the person, is to use the modern concept of intellectual. The Confucian idea of a junzi, of a profound person, is very comparable to the modern idea of an intellectual. The person is an activist not just interested in the contemplative mode of life, not a scholar in the sense confining all his time and energy in a library or in archival research, but his social conscience dictates that's actively involved in society. There's a kind of practical reasoning that urge the profound person to confront the world of power and influence and to transform it from within. So such a person, the intellectual, as a leader of the society, the product of higher education, is someone who is willing to confront power and influence. He's not a, he's not a, uh, a hermit, not someone who decides not to have anything to do with power and influence. But he confronts in power and influence, hopefully he will be able to transform it from within. There's a faith that a person cherishes. The faith is in the improvability and even perfectibility of the human condition through self-effort. Any kind of self-effort is going to make a difference. The assumption here, to uh, quote Wen Booth again, the assumption here is that human beings come into existence through communication. The term he uses is symbolic interchange, interchange through words, gestures, ideas, meanings. We are created in the process of sharing intentions, sharing values, sharing meanings. We are created in the sense, we are created as social beings because we share intentions, values, meanings. In fact, we are more like each other than different. From the limited Confucian point of view, you want to analyze people of different cultural backgrounds, of different social backgrounds, and different, uh, uh, different talents, uh, different uh, emotional uh, styles, and so forth. Still, 
more like each other than different, more valuable in our commonality, commonality as members of the human, of the human family than in our idiosyncrasies. Not, in fact, anything at all when considered totally separately from our relationships. So it's an it's a overall assumption about how human beings come into being. Viewed from this perspective, the whole world defined in terms of the, of the polarities, normally we're quite familiar with these two polarities, individual and society, shifts. The whole world of meaning shifts. Even usages of words like I, mine, self, or mine, this is mine rather than yours, must be reconsidered. Because the borderlines between the self and other have either disappeared or shifted sharply. You've read Fingerets, Confucius, Secular at Sacred. One of the most intriguing and powerful image, powerful statement he made. Uh, I, uh, frankly, I disagree with his observation, but a very powerful image interpretation is this, is this statement. The images of the inner man and his inner conflict are not essential to a concept of man as a being whose dignity is the consummation of a life of subtlety and sophistication, a life in which human conduct can be intelligible in natural terms and yet be attuned to the sacred, a life in which the practical, the intellectual, and the spiritual are equally revered and are harmonized in the one act the act of Li or the act of ritual. So each one of us is in that process of ritual. We can even say ritualization as humanization. And there's no need for us to posit the idea of an inner life. I disagree with his argument that there's no idea of the inner life or even the psychic life in the Analects, certainly Mencius and so forth. But I appreciate his emphasis on the idea of the human as communicative, dialogical, and the process of interchange. But if you look at Confucius as an example, as an example of this, and he opted not for superior intelligence, he made it very clear that it was not particularly intelligent. The people who will be able to create without prior knowledge, and he's not one of them. So he's not a person endowed with superior intelligence. Nor was he a person with prophetic power. He was not able to anticipate, not able to foretell, and he's part of the ordinary human community. But the dignity of this man is his ability to live the full life as an ordinary human being despite apparent failures in his career of public service. He failed quite a number of times. And he opted for something which in the long run even more powerful and influential, at least if you look at uh, the history of what he actually accomplished. That is totally devoted to education. Education in terms of exemplary teaching. And there's a principle of, e the principle of egalitarianism in his philosophical educational approach. That is self-improvement self through self-reflection is a birthright of every human being at any stage of life in any social class, under any circumstances. But this is not something which is totally related to the self-introspection. The person is not simply an isolated individual in that sense. The person ought not be obsessed with oneself but ought to try to participate fully in the fellowship of the like-minded 
to contribute to the general fund, we can now use the modern term social capital, not just economic capital, the social capital of well-being, both material and spiritual well-being of human community as a whole. Now look at it as a kind of a investment strategy. The investment strategy is to say, I want to invest in an area which no matter when, at any juncture, in any context, the fund can be increased. And that investment strategy is long term. It's comprehensive. It's multidimensional. And there's no limit. Even if I don't do anything, even my thinking process, my talking about it, will make a difference in this particular fund. You can imagine it like uh, a stream that flows into a pond. The pond is the general fund of the social capital in terms of education. So Confucius didn't imagine himself as a creator of a pond. He's simply one of those streams. But he would, he would see to it that a stream flows eventually into the pond. So he is one of those instruments that help to increase the fund of social capital, which eventually, hopefully, will transform the society. And this investment requires wisdom because you have to invest wisely. And he believes if you invest in wealth and power, it may be extremely gratifying in a short period of time for yourself, for members of your family, and for maybe a small community. But in the long run, in terms of human flourishing, it may not be the best investment strategy at all. It may turn out to be disastrous. From the Buddhist point of view, it's definitely disastrous. From the Confucian point of view, wealth and power are fine if they are transformed into some kind of energy for social transformation. If they're not, they can also turn out to be extremely disastrous. But the education is not simply for the cultivation of the mind. It's not a kind of abstract idealism. It is also the well-being of the society as a whole, including all the members of, in the society. So the vision, the vision that uh, Finger Red and others were so impressed about, is the vision of being human as a creator, not simply as creatures, but as creators, not only creating our own universe, our world, but we became co-creators of nature and of heaven. The creativity of the human community is such that we have to have a very lofty vision of what we can do in the long run. But this lofty vision has to be implemented in the things near at hand. So the, the vision is lofty. The mission is very down to earth here and now, how to improve my own condition as a human being. Sometimes just by thinking, I made some mistakes I want to correct. If I correct one mistake that I made in terms of the total fund of education of the universe, this of course lofty idea, it's an improvement. If I failed, I don't even fail simply as an individual, I fail as a member of a community, even as a much larger project. So this, this vision you can even use the modern idea of thinking globally and uh, acting locally. Thinking in terms of a very global, even cosmological vision about human flourishing as a communal enterprise, but you act immediately and take care of the things near at hand. That's critical. So in this sense, then, Confucius considered himself, I think in a humble way, but also in a humane way, as an instrument through which the values of the human can be realized. That idea of an instrument is an end rather than simply a means to an end. That's why you have a very fascinating discussion in Finger Red that we, we have to become instruments. Hopefully we become good instruments rather than, than uh, poor instruments. And then of course, in the Analects, Confucius insisted that a profound person is not a vessel. A profound person is not simply an instrument. So we want to be used, but not used for very limited, selfish, 
and short-term investment projects. We want to use for long-term, long-term in the sense even eternity, how to contribute to this particular fund. And of course, if we take the idea of social capital of this general human fund seriously, we have to say that what Confucius maybe naively envisions is never simply the zero-sum game. There's a different game involved. The zero-sum game is an economic game, is a political game, maybe even a game in social status. That is, in the economic sense, if some people become very rich, other people become poor. And if you have the finite set of uh, things to be, to be shared, you got 60, and I only have 40. If I in increase mine to 50, you will have 50. So this is the zero sum situation. And the conflicts all occurred precisely because of this. For a number of years, we believe that the, that the whole repertoire is going to be greatly expanded. So even though it, the funds are not equally distributed, uh, since uh, by comparison, we'd be better off tomorrow than today, and certainly better off today than yesterday, we can tolerate it. But what the Confucians have in mind in terms of this particular investment strategy is not a zero-sum game. It's the, it's the conception, and I think very realistic conception, that overwhelming majority of the games we play as human beings are not zero-sum games. Conversation, especially in, in modern philosophical thinking, edifying conversation is going to enhance the spirits of all the people involved. So through that conversation, everybody gains. No one, no one loses. Dialogue, symbolic interchange, wisdom, knowledge, even the healthy sign of competition. The healthy sign of competition is to enhance the human potential for excellence. Let's say a pianist, and he's greatly enhanced his ability to play the piano and become the greatest pianist of the time, and yet without stopping there and still continue to improve his performance as the greatest pianist of the country, everybody gains. Anyone who listens to it is uh, a part of this ritual process. A scholar who becomes a better scholar, a scientist who becomes a better scientist, an athlete who becomes a better athlete, all these competitions, all these quests for excellence turn out to be not zero-sum games at all. They are standards of inspiration. And in fact, the overwhelming majority of the things we do in ordinary uh, human interaction turn out to be games that are not zero-sum at all. Now, what type of personality Confucius exhibited in this particular connection? Mencius, uh, we're going to uh, discuss Mencius next week. So I'm not going to talk about the, the final, uh, because of the time, the final portion of the Mencius ideal. I'm going to talk about it, to pick it up next time. But in the Mencius perception, what Confucius accomplished was three values, personality values. Mencius talked about three kinds of sages. Now, the idea of a sage is someone who's fully realized himself or herself. The fully realized human being is a sage. A sage is not a superior person in the sense, a superhuman. A sage is the most authentic, most fully realized human. There are three types. Even at that level, there are many different types. One type of sagehood exhibits purity. Purity of will and purity of thought. Purity in the sense of authenticity. The steadfastness of purpose is never compromised. The highest human ideal is being realized as a total commitment to uh, many of the great religious figures can very well be considered as sage, uh, pure sages. But they're also accommodating sages. Accommodating sages are these sages 
who are not that much involved in their own sense of purity. They're involved in the world and try to transform the world, like the Buddhist idea of the Bodhisattva. What is the Bodhisattva? The Bodhisattva is someone who has earned the right to fully realize himself by leaving the world, enter into nirvana, but out of compassion. He wants to come back and help the world to transform itself. That sense of accommodating out of compassion of the world here now. There's another type of sagehood is harmony. The sage who wants to harmonize himself or herself in the world. Not to make prejudgment, but to be an integral part of this. Mencius considered Confucius, even though an ordinary person with all kinds of frustrations, not particularly successful as a politician, so to speak, managed to combine these three types of sageliness. And the term that he used in describe this man is timeliness. Timeliness in the sense of fitting. Remember, we, when we talk about ritual, an important function of ritual is not rules superimposed, but the appropriateness of that particular form, uh, that particular form in expressing our inner thought. So that sense of ritual is appropriate. That's why ritual is sometimes rendered as propriety. So the timeliness in this connection is the person who is pure when purity is required, who can accommodate because there is flexibility, and who can harmonize. And the choice, the person who's made a choice is totally linked to the person's own structural limitation. The structural limitation now defines the particular nature of the person. All the structural limitations, we can think about it, you can list the structural limitations we, ha we have. And once you list that structural limitations, single out those you consider the most powerful structural limitations of, in your life. And try to see whether any one of them can in fact become a vehicle for true self-expression in a powerful, transformative way, not in a selfish, egoistic manner. What Confucius managed to do then is a fitting expression of what a human being ought to do under the circumstances. The time failed him. He was not able to, to become politically uh, prominent. Certainly, he was not very wealthy. And in fact, he didn't earn a great deal of reputation. He was criticized time and time again. And yet, he managed to do the most proper way of the time. We have uh, two to three minutes for maybe a couple of questions. Any, uh, any questions? Uh, don't be timid. Just uh, short questions or long questions. Okay, well, I'll keep on trying. 